Around 10 years ago, there was this movement known as Sustain the Industry, where people would post their hauls of anime and manga merchandise on social media, all in the name of capitalizing the business in the West. While it was mostly fear-mongering by people, the landscape was vastly different back then compared to now, as anime streaming was beginning to take off, but with very few titles. People would still need to wait a couple years between the Japanese release date and English release date for anime and manga until its growth eventually accelerated. The reason I bring this up is because it compelled me to buy my first manga volume. This was special to me because it was in Japanese, as no one had licensed the series yet. I felt my money was well spent when I bought Siren Volume 7 off Yes Asia in order to support its creator, Iwashiro Toshiaki, even if it was minimal. This volume is special to me as not only does it feature my favorite character on the cover, but it is what I consider the turning point in the story. You see, the volume leaves off on a cliffhanger of the beginning of the fourth trip to the world of Siren as the body count begins to pile up. It seems like all hope is lost for our heroes until a bright light appears that would save not only the characters, but possibly the series getting axed early on. Before we reach that point, however, we need to take a look back at the series' history. Fighting. Siren is a suspenseful action manga by Iroshiro Toshiaki, which began serialization in the first issue of 2008 for Weekly Shonen Jump, published on December 3rd, 2007. It follows school ruffian Ageha Yoshina as he tries to rescue his classmate, Sakuraka Amamiya, from the mysterious society known as Siren, led by Nemesis Q. The problem is that Nemesis Q transports him to a wasteland where he competes in a game for his life. The story soon reveals that Siren is actually 10 years into the future, and people who travel to Siren develop psionic powers. In an effort to figure out the cause of Siren and ways to prevent it, Ageha must learn to master his new abilities before time runs out. This is a brief overview as Ageha meets new companions along the way, but the main premise is to travel back and forth through time. Iroshiro Toshiaki explained in an interview that the premise emerged after completing his previous series, Miro Hito. He watched a movie from his childhood that he loved after several viewings, Back to the Future and the idea about traveling back and forth through time emerged where the characters make slight changes with each trip, similar to the movie. In the same interview, he mentions how he planned the story from the start and focuses on implementing many foreshadowing techniques in key panels of manga. In fact, he mentions this several times in the various afterwords at the end of each volume, where he needs to assure certain things are mentioned during this pivotal time in the manga. As a suspenseful action manga, Hiroshiro sensei needed to keep the viewers engaged, so he usually left each chapter off on a cliffhanger to have viewers coming back for the next issue. However, he wanted to assure that Siren didn't become a cult following, but be popular enough to be able to run in Shonen Jump. While people in the West praised Siren, the Japanese didn't during its run, but it has seen a resurgence with the release of it on electronic readers. So. Why did people enjoy Siren so much, and how did the story go? Fighting. Siren's first chapter had intrigued people from the start, and it kept them coming for more, as Siren was the only series from this round of serialization to survive. The first chapter introduces us to the hero and heroine of the series, Yoshina Ageha and Amamiya Sakurako. While laying the premise of the series for viewers by having Amamiya disappear and Ageha going to Siren to rescue her. The first chapter does plenty of foreshadowing through Ageha's dialogue on a meteor hitting Earth and climate change to Usui searching for holders of Siren cards. Another important note is that it sets Ageha up as a protagonist who is willing to help whomever, even if he does it under the false pretense of getting 10,000 yen. The cliffhanger of this chapter is Ageha being transported to Siren leaving many questions and hopes of viewers to come back. This is an interesting tactic to use because most first chapters of manga are complete and self-contained, especially considering that some are reworked from one-shots. Some series that have left on a cliffhanger first chapter are Bleach and The Promised Neverland, and the reason this may work is because it gives the reader the motivation of the protagonist for the story, with Ageha's being to protect Amamiya. 
Obviously, series like Naruto, One Piece, and Black Clover have the I'm gonna be king aspect, but when it is to protect someone, such as in Siren, Bleach, and The Promised Neverland, the readers can relate by having family and friends they want to protect. As a first chapter, it compels the reader with a reason to return. After this, Ageha meets Hiryu Asaga, an old friend of his and Amamiya's who is looking for his friend Tatsuo. Only the three of them survive the first trip to Siren alongside a grubby old man who dies shortly thereafter. We meet Matsuri Yagumo, who is the mentor of the series that teaches the characters about Sai. The reader gets a sense of the pattern here where the present is for training and the future is for fighting, yet there are some appearances in the reverse, such as fights involving Kagetora Hyodo in the present. Speaking of that, Kagetora is a friend of Matsuri Sensei who helps with training the drifters, and she has another ally in Ian, a specialist of cure that focuses on healing. We meet two other members in Oboro Mochizuki, a famous actor that acts childish and is calculating in his demeanor, and Kabuto Kurisaki, a womanizing cheat that constantly runs away from his problems. With Ageha, Amumi, and Hiryu, we finally have our main siren team that time travels. Then we meet Elmore Tenjuin, an old lady that can foresee the future and is raising psychic youth to prevent the destruction of the world she foresaw in a vision. The adopted psychic youth she raises at her estate consists of Kyle, a wild child who can materialize prisms, Van, a silent cure user, Xiao, a calm child that can read thoughts and identify locations, Frederica, a self-centered girl of pyrokinesis, and Marie, a crybaby that socializes in telekinesis. Together, they are the Elmore Wood Gang and act as the present-day heroes that we see in the story. During their third trip to Siren, the Drifters get many answers about the future and present foreshadowing of details important to the plot, particularly with the Promised Tears and Day of Rebirth Revolution on December 2nd. Then we finally get the appearance of the antagonist of the story in The Wise, a group of psychicers who want to rebuild the world to be purely psychicers and contain no humans. The first rendition of the group consists of Grana, the first star commander that uses telekinesis, Junus, the second star commander that uses the divine blade, Shiner, the third star commander who can teleport, Caprico, the fourth star commander that can manifest her drawings, and Doliki, the fifth star commander with exposure to create combustions. The latter of which is who first faces the Drifters and suffers the defeats to them due to his cockiness. The group returns in Volume 5, where a larger arc occurs through Volume 7 with Kagetora chasing down psychicers who stole money from a Yakuza family, but the enemy gets the upper hand and captures him. This leaves Akaha to rescue him alone while other people are away, yet he does get assistance from the Elmore Wood gang. They eventually learn they are chasing down the Wise and find out that Lan and Haruhiko are hired by Wise to help secure money. Eventually, the group finds their hideout with Kagetora and a battle ensues. This is where they come face to face with someone disguised as the younger brother of Inui, a brainwashed puppet, who is the main antagonist of the series, Amagi Miroku. He injures Agiha and Kyle in the process, but they are saved as he walks away. After recovery, the Drifters learn of a key detail that Elmore Tenjuin will pass away in a plane crash and the group tries to stop her but Nemesis Q calls them to Siren. The group thinks they didn't save her, and as a result, didn't save the children. But then Shiner and Dolaki appear. Shiner teleports Amamiya, Hiryu, and Oboro away to a separate location, while Dolaki faces Ageha alone. The seventh volume ends with Kabuto running away to find help. Now we have reached a point that I wanted to talk about, where I can gush about the point of Siren. Beginning with volume eight, Yurushiro updates the cover to foretell massive changes within the story. This isn't revolutionary as Servo Manga had done something similar, such as having different colored titles or fonts to denote a new school year or denote different tones or arcs, such as with Katakyo Hitman Reborn having a white to color gradient for lighthearted chapters, black to color gradient for the serious chapters, and a rainbow logo for the Arco Baleno arc. From volumes 1 to 7, Iwashiro Sensei had the main characters of the story on white backgrounds, nothing more. This could serve as an introductory saga, or may symbolize the unknown future ahead because one of the major themes of Siren is changing your destiny, which they struggle with doing during these volumes. Then from volume 8 onwards, the covers have the background featured with more dynamic poses. The change in cover serves as the possibility of change since the characters see their efforts of changing the future at the end of volume 7 and see a huge change in volume 8. The drastic shift from a blank open background to one of colors and scenes signals to the reader that the story is at a turning point. 
Volume 8 features the group struggling against the wise as Kabuto struggles on running away after Ageha trusted him from the previous trip. Before Doloki finishes Ageha off, Kabuto uses his ability to foresee death and saves Ageha by having Kabuto sacrifice himself instead. The chapters leading up to this moment from the previous volume change the series and literally altered fates. The next chapter, Light, sees the appearance of the Elmore Wood children 10 years later and proves that fates can be altered. The importance of these chapters is that Iroshiro Sensei planned for this since the beginning, but things changed. In volume 16, he revealed that Kabuto was supposed to die and never come back during these volumes in order to develop Ageha's character. He decided to change Kabuto's fate at the end of volume 7, the chapter before his intended sacrifice. It is apropos that someone who can change the fate of others has his fate changed in the process. This is likely why Kabuto's ability of menace manifested Yo-Yo as a burst and aided in creating the paradigm of the chicken soul, where he literally grabs fate and throws it right back. While I want to talk about other details in the series regarding its story, I will leave it here for you to go read the series yourself. From this point on, I will be talking about themes and several plot details in the story. If you don't want to be spoiled, Go read the manga now and return later. I promise you, you will not regret reading Siren. Hey everyone, so I started writing this essay all the way back in 2018 after my Myself Yourself retrospective video. A lot has changed since then from what I originally wrote. We are six pages in of the original 25 page essay, but I noticed a few problems. First, the next six pages consisted of theory crafting all dedicated to the wise. I felt this would make the video too long and removed it. I may make it into another video, but long story short, the names of the Wise are likely using Gordo Awase to denote their star commander ranks. For example, Amagi Miroku contains Roku for 6 since he is the 6th Grigori experiment. Vigo contains Go for 5 and he is the 5th star commander, and etc. Meanwhile, Capriko's birth name is Riko Hachiboshi, which translates to 8 stars, but she is star commander 6. So I've theorized there would be 10 star commanders in total, where she would be star commander 8, and point to other evidence. Then the next 10 pages were talking about the flaws of Siren that contributed to its downfall. As I reread it over and over again, I felt it didn't meet the aim of my original goal for it being a retrospective. Thus, I am focusing on talking about themes and characters of the story because Siren has a lot of things going for it, and I do not want to stray from that. Now then, let's get back to the essay. As previously said, two prevalent themes in Siren are trying to change fate and dealing with loss. Ageha's character struggles routinely with having people die before him that he is unable to save. This is clear in the first two trips, even though they are idiotic to run off alone. However, in the fourth trip and fourth present arcs, Ageha exclaims how he hates that people die that he cannot save. This is in reference to Tenju and Elmore and the Elmore Wood children in the fourth trip, and Koichi Iba in the fourth present time arc. Right before Doloki finishes them off, Ageha is frustrated that he cannot save anyone, including his friends. He probably feels responsible for their deaths due to some internal conflict, which is why he wants the power to change the world, which is what he says in chapter 101. This is in response to the situation of the Grigori project continuing no matter what, and will continue to affect innocent people. Matsuri asks in response if it is not the power to protect that he wants, and he responds that whichever is fine with him. This continues into the other theme of changing fate as the world is fated to become devastated by wise, or maybe even something worse. You see, Iroshiro pointed out several issues in the first chapter of Siren about the destruction of Earth. While one of them alluded to an asteroid, which would become a plot point later on, it briefly lays out climate change, nuclear weapons, suicide, and economic issues, which all do appear in Siren. All of this to paint the picture that humanity is doomed and the planet's destruction is inevitable, and there's nothing we can do about it. Personally, I enjoy stories where people change fate or destiny as it means not everything is set in stone. As I am transgender, I would love to change my fate of being born male and having gender dysphoria. People have told me many times it is impossible to change my sex and that I can't change God's destiny he has laid out for me by straying from that path. It seems hopeless and appears as a huge wall you cannot see past. 
It is the same for our world being destroyed and the world of Siren ending. Or is it? While Nemesis Q's creator brings up the idea of parallel worlds, each world wishes to undo the destruction in their own way, either by preventing it entirely or even restarting life. People can make changes to prevent forthcoming disasters and can continue their progress into the future through the fact of adversity following calamity. Ultimately, Siren is a manga about hope. Slowly, the drifters change the future bit by bit, which helps them overall. Even other characters try to change this fact, such as Elmore's prediction of the ruined world by adopting psychic children and building a bunker to preserve humanity or even Usui interfering with the deaths of several future Siren Drifters by taking the Siren calling cards from them before they could use it. If a group of teenagers can prevent the destruction of our world from an alien force, what is it to say that we, as humans, cannot do the same in all types of issues we face? This makes it seem that anyone can change fate even by a small amount, and that the possibilities are endless, as vast as the starry sky. Often, Ageha is compared to a starry sky throughout the series, such as with Shao and Iba. This likely refers to how his sigh of Melsi's door can have different forms and serve as an inspiration for his abilities. It contrasts with Muroku, who wishes to be the center of the universe with all attention drawn towards him. Since Ageha represents a bunch of different stars, it is apparent that Ageha and Muroku will clash repeatedly since Ageha is the outside force drawn to the supposed center of the universe. Come to think of it, what is actually at the center of the universe? Is it a planet like Earth? A burning star like the sun? Or maybe a satellite like the moon? Or maybe, just maybe, there is nothing. Fighting. You see, between these two characters, they do represent the sun and the moon. Muroku is the sun, someone who creates light and wishes to be the center of attention, similar to the sun within the solar system. He often references a crown, whether it be his Sephiroth ability or the flower crown of his sister, he desires to be a king and this is relatable to the sun's corona. On the other hand, Ageha is the moon. He is the tyrannical king of the moon that he inhibits with Melsi's which is his power, and revolves around others to support them. His darkness within and the black burst he holds is similar to a new moon that can block out light. These traits appear in the character design as well. Muroku has bright red hair like the sun and has sharp eyes that appear masculine in nature. The mane on his coat resembles a lion, an animal often associated with the sun, but represents the wolf in sheep's clothing, symbolizing a psychiker in a world full of humans someone who isn't like those sheeple that follow others blindly. Ageha is more rounded and welcoming as a character in terms of appearance, as Uroshiro designed him with rounder eyes that make him have a gentler appearance on a suggestion by his editor, which he states in the first volume. This allows readers to put themselves into his shoes with a lunar appearance. Since people often perceive the moon as feminine, the design can give off a feminine vibes through his round eyes and less chiseled facial features. The blue hair contrasts Muroku's red to reinforce the rivalry between them. Ageha's last name, Yoshina, foreshadows his dark appearance and the moon as it translates to Night Hole, obviously referencing the black hole that devours everything, Melsi's door, but alludes to the moon as the bringer of night, with it being the massive hole in the sky during this dark period which can seem like a savior of light at the end of the tunnel. These contrasts are stated outright in the last two volumes of the manga, but I found it poetic how Yoshiro thought of it ahead of time, especially since it seems space is a huge component of the series, acknowledging Ouroboros and Quat Nevas. With that being said, the series didn't get too much time to focus on individual characters aside from the main contenders. The whole ordeal of Quat Nevas is quickly played out, obviously because of Siren's rushed ending, but the character of Mithra is really an enigma. Yoshiro Sensei likely had ideas pertaining to this character, but nothing emerged in the manga until the end. However, Siren did get two light novels, one during its run, and another after its conclusion to tie up loose ends. We do learn a bit more about Mithra in the second light novel, but not much. However, we do see the lives of other characters that couldn't be explored in the manga. Thankfully, I do own both copies from the initial print as they came with Siren bookmarks, which I find as a nice surprise. 
Additionally, there are translations of the novels up on a Tumblr page by Himitsuri, which I will link in the description below. While there are a couple stories I want to talk about, those may be saved for another day. What I want to talk about is the chapter titled The Birth of Crimson from the first novel. As you may surmise, the chapter focuses on Frederica Tenjuin. We get her backstory expanded upon that was only a short one-page tale in the manga. Frederica came from a wealthy background, but was born with pyrokinetic abilities that she could not control. In the light novel, we learn not only that she burned a house down due to a tantrum, but it was on her birthday and not getting a present she wanted. Partially. She thinks her parents despise her because they kept referring to her abilities as the devil's power. Of course, if you hear your parents call your powers come from the devil, you will be frightened, thinking they hate you, and cry about it. She did this and blacked out, causing her to burn the house down where her father and mother tried to rescue her. In the resulting aftermath, her parents sent her to Elmore Tenjuin to help her control her powers, yet she takes this as a message that she isn't wanted anymore. This occurs on March 24th, 2005, Frederica's sixth birthday, while the backstory is explained 10 years into the future on March 24th, 2015. Her story appears to take place in the alternate timeline between the fourth and fifth trips where Ageha's group doesn't return, as she remarks in the story of not seeing them again. Frederica ventures into her burned down house in the ruined world of Siren and discovers a locked chest with a combination inside her old bedroom that is fireproof. She thinks it is a cruel joke by her parents as she struggles to open it, but it is then attacked by a tabu. When she tries to fight back, her flames won't come out because she still possesses hidden feelings for her home and her parents she cannot rid herself from. If she burns the house down again, will her parents scold her? Her mother wouldn't be too happy. How would Papa feel? They built good memories here, even if she was spoiled. Actually, why should she care if her parents gave her away and didn't want her anymore? Why was she even born? Why are we even born? We're all destined to die, right? What is the purpose of living if others despise me? If people want me erased from their lives? Even if I am just a random person who falls into a category they despise, they still want me gone because I impede on their life just as a premonition. I should have never been born. This is the thought Frederica struggles with as her powers fail to emerge against the tabu. She regrets ever being born and thinks the world would be better off without her if she didn't exist. The title, Birth of Crimson, means multiple things. In Japanese, the title is Guren no Seitan, where Guren is crimson and Seitan means a gracious birth, something similar to a god. In fact, putting it into Google gives you Christmas, which is the birth of Jesus Christ. So you could say it means nativity of crimson, as not only is it referring to Frederica, a wealthy child, but it is taking place at her home, her birthplace in a sense, that she doesn't want to burn down. In relation, those powers come from the devil, or so her parents claim. So that must mean her powers are evil, and her birth should not be celebrated. Unless those powers come from God, or Frederica herself is God. But if her inner turmoil deals with human emotions, which some people think would be lowly of a god, and she cannot use her powers, what can she do? During her conflict, an apparition of her mother appears before Frederica, taunting her. Because she is dead, obviously she wouldn't be alive in the destroyed world of Siren, but we learn that she died in the hospital after the fire. Although the direct cause is never stated, Frederica feels responsible for her death and burning her father during her tantrum. Then another apparition appears. It's soft. Familiar understanding of her predicaments because they've been there before. They have a demon inside of them by the name of Melsies, yet that didn't stop them from controlling their power. Even though they are gone from this world, that doesn't mean they are gone in spirit. They taunt Frederica in order to drop the I shouldn't have ever been born spiel and remind her that Ravishing Rose would never give up. In fact, I think they would say something like, not giving up is my magic. And then after this enlightening pep talk, a crimson devil is born. 
similar to Kabuto's Yo-Yo or Number 7's Nemesis Q, the three-horned devil Salamandra appears to burn everything in the vicinity, except it doesn't. It only harms those that are enemies, leaving her friends and home unscathed. Afterwards, we learn that the combination to the fireproof box is her birthday and contains two things, a magic wand toy of the amazing Ravishing Rose and a card. Granny Elmore informs us that Frederica's parents loved her dearly and wanted to protect her. They felt responsible for her being born with powers and thought the devil cast it upon them, not Frederica. Her parents thought letting her stay at Elmore Wood would help her control her powers, and they were expecting her to return home one day and hope to give her that gift. The card in the box said two things. Happy birthday, Frederica, and thank you for being born. While I wanted to write this video essay for a long time, I always pushed it off as I was displeased with several things in it. I felt like I did not do Siren justice. One thing many fans wish to justify Siren's existence is an anime adaptation. Right now, Siren is a cult following of routine comments on YouTube and Twitter talking about how amazing it is, yet they think it needs an anime adaptation, but does it need one? Technically, no. Siren is a great manga that anyone can read at their own pace. There may be a few things that can deter people, but it is a great shonen manga regardless about kids of psionic powers trying to change their own destinies. The main reason a manga gets an anime is to attract new readers, which would be beneficial, but is it feasible after it already ended? In the past few years, something interesting has been happening that may foreshadow Siren getting an anime. Possibly. In Anime Japan's fourth event, they started a What Manga Would You Like to See Become an Anime poll where people could vote on different series. The first poll had 10 finished manga series and 10 currently running manga series, with Siren appearing at number 5 on the finished list alongside Katakuri Circus and Muyon Ruji's Bureau of Supernatural Investigation, which all gone anime well after they concluded. In the fifth event's poll, they had the poll for all series rather than being split, with Siren appearing at number 6. Other series such as Bloom Into You, The Promised Neverland, and Muyo and Ruji again appear with all of them getting an anime adaptation that same year. The next year, they made the list limited to only series running in 2018, so Siren would not appear again, and it would remain for the same for future events. This change may be a result of the old manga flooding the request in that currently running series, but with Siren appearing multiple times, it would suggest it could get an anime adaptation, yet it has been a couple years since then with no news, and it seems very unlikely at this point. If only there were discussions of it at some point to warrant it. Well, I do have some interesting information. You see, one of the things I remembered was that Siren got a vomic, or a voice comic, back in 2010. This aired in January of that year on Sakiyomi Jump Bang, a variety show focused on all things Shonen Jump, where they focus on a title each week and include a vomic at the end of each episode. You may have seen me using some clips of the vomic throughout the video already, but when I went to find something, I was startled to find that the Japanese Shonen Jump YouTube channel uploaded the vomic with commentary from the voice actors. While they usually talk about the characters or side topics, the last one had something interesting. I will play it out in full, and I did translate it to the best of my abilities. There may be some errors, but I can assure you, they are indeed talking about an anime adaptation. For context, Takahiro Sakurai, who played Ageha Yoshina, is talking with Keiichi Sonobe, who played Usui, about Siren and then speaks to who I presume is a producer or editor. I don't know the full details, but this at least hints at possible talks of an anime. まあ、でもどんどん作品にも絡んできてるんでしょうね、今後の展開としては。まあ、ボミックではここまでなんですけど。はい。知ってるよね。はい。知ってるんだ。
<笑>そうですね。こういうことぜひ言うと嫌がる。<笑><笑>こっそり落とされたりするす。ええー、そうですね。でもそういう夢を持ってもいいのかな。そうじゃあ私の能力で薄いの能力でね。<笑><笑>そんな能力はないよって。薄いさんすごいですね。誰だよそんな能力があるって。アニメ化させる能力。<笑><笑><笑>それ欲しいな<笑> Now they uploaded this in 2013, a few years after the episode aired and after Siren ended. Since the episode aired in 2010, I would assume they recorded the Evolmic in late 2009 because several episodes filmed during Jump Festa, so this commentary had to be filmed at least in 2009 or 2010 at the latest. This suggests either an anime was in pre production but stopped for some reason, the editor or producer were in talks with studios to produce an adaptation of Siren, or there was no discussion but Takahiro Sakurai really wanted an anime of Siren and teased people with this. The commentary does not prove an anime existed in the first place but can suggest such a thing occurred. At the very least, the person who played Ageha on the Vomic wanted a Siren anime. Which may have been a note to whoever was in the room. Just knowing this bit of information gives me hope of an adaptation one day, but I am content with Siren as a series overall. You know, I first read this series when I was struggling with my own gender identity and needed something to take my mind off things. Whenever I would be down, I would pull out my copies of Siren to read and enjoy because of my love for the series. It taught me about hope, change, and existence. Hopefully, this retrospective can serve as a massive thank you.